Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Michael Darling. I'm the Chief Curator at the MCA in, here in Chicago, and I'm joined by Suzanne Gez, the uh, Emerita Director of the Renaissance Society. Is that a fair way to uh, describe uh, Suzanne? Right. 40 years later. <laughs> Uh, and we're here today to talk a little bit about Isa Genske, the great German artist, uh, because I'm working on an exhibition of Isa's work, a, a big retrospective show that we are at the MCA, we're co-organizing with MoMA in New York in the Dallas Museum of Art, and it'll, it will open at MoMA in uh, November of this year, so it's coming right up. Um, the only other non-commercial gallery show that Issa ever had in the United States was at the Renaissance Society with Suzanne in 1992. So, as you can, well, as we all know, Suzanne's often ahead of the curve. You know, you can you couldn't count on two hands of the number of shows that you could say the same thing about that the artist that Suzanne showed well before anyone else did. Um, but the fact, I, I think, the thing that we that we'd love to talk about today is especially Issa's time here in Chicago, how influential it was on her own work. Uh, and also, I'm very curious for Suzanne to tell us a little bit about the context in which she found and discovered Issa's work at that time and, and what it was like and what she was like at the time. Um, yes, looking back, I think it, the first time I saw the work was in 1982. Uh, and I had gone to Rudy Fuchs' Documenta Documenta 7, uh, which for me was very thrilling at the time. I went back, what, 30 years ago? And there were these, the long, wooden, elegant, elegant, 30 feet long um, pieces, these ellipsoids. Um, and I was very taken with them. Also, on the, they were on the, on the floor, in the Fredericianum, and um, there were, were the pieces on the wall as well, uh, wooden pieces. So th there were none of the concrete pieces. Um, perhaps in 82, I don't know the chronology. I don't think they had been made uh, then. Um, so it was probably 1990 when I got back in touch with Isa. Although I have to say, um, over the years, and I'm always eager to point this out. Anne Rohrmer has been a big influence and friend and uh, colleague and worked at the Art Institute for a while, but she was one of the first to show conceptual art uh, here in the, in the city and, and to show it extensively. The Europe in the 70s was a, a very important exhibition and Annie had uh, pointed me in that direction of ESA. The other person was Casper Koenig. Casper uh, Koenig was at, um, he was head of the school in Frankfurt, the, uh, the art school, but he was also head of uh, Porticus, which was a very vanguard um, exhibition space. And it was one really that early on I wanted to model the Renaissance Society after. Casper's really been a, a great role model for me. So, in fact, it was in talking with Casper that we came up with this idea of doing, sharing an exhibition. And the exhibition started at the Renaissance Society. Now, if I can remember, it went to, uh, to Portugas in Frankfurt. It went to Belgium, to the Palais de, de Beaux-Arts, and it went to one other place. But anyway, it was another European venue. So for the Little Renaissance Society, that was just very uh, exciting to be able to have that, um, that reach and to be in, in that scene and talking to uh, European artists and being in dialogue with them and beginning to understand what was happening there and how it differed from what was going on here in the 80s and the 90s. We have one shot uh, in color of Suzanne's show with Issa, this is 1992 at the Renaissance Society. Um, and um, in a minute, we'll, we'll sort of, we can show some other slides of some of the works on an individual basis. But um, one of the things that's always struck me about Issa's work and what I think makes it so influential is how 
uh, how much variety there is in her work, and she's constantly reinventing herself and never sticking to one type of art making. You probably saw the, um, you know, those two ellipsoid pieces, which are very minimal. These are actually made using computers to guide uh, the shaping of these wooden sculptures, which are then incredibly finely uh, polished and sanded and painted, so they're absolutely perfect. Um, you know, in terms of craftsmanship and all of that, um, it, it, they, they started to get even more complicated with, with what she called hyperbolos like this, where the shapes become more um, complicated and unusual. Um, but then at the very same time she was making these, she also was uh, appropriating photographs from magazines. This was a whole, this, sorry, this slide's a little fuzzy, but she was re-photographing hi-fi ads from different magazines and representing them as her own work. And you can see it's the same time she's making those um, very minimal sculptures. And also making photographs such as this, which is in the MCA's collection, um, she's just decided to start photographing the ears of various friends and colleagues, both in Dusseldorf, but also when she was in um, uh, New York uh, for a period of time. And there are, I've tried to, in the catalog essay that I wrote for this upcoming show, try to find connections that link between these things. And I mean, I think there must be a connection between ears and hi-fi machines. She was also making sculptures um, about with and about radios and transmission of sound. And do you have the other ones that are concrete? I think uh, I do. With the antenna yeah, there, they are, the world receivers. Yeah. I love those. I have to tell you, you know, I'm not anyone who collects, but boy, if I had been a collector at the time, I wanted one of those. It was just so I don't know, intense. I mean, there was this thing called the World Receiver, and I think that's what that's was what, on the on uh, right. And uh, I remember her saying that it, um, it had been a present because she really wanted one, and, and the notion that she could bring in the whole world into just this box. Um, seduced her fully, but then she took that and made that idea into this intense concrete piece, but leaving the anten antenna, um, I think we'll bring well, these. I'm, I'm glad to hear you're going to have them in the exhibition. Yeah, and I'll have this in the show too. She still owns it, and like, like Suzanne said, this was um, top of the line audio equipment, and you can get every kind of mm -hmm. radio station from around the world into this little radio, and I think her mother either bought it for her or gave her the money to buy it. And, but essentially, it's not that dissimilar from Jeff Koons taking a brand new vacuum cleaner and putting it right. in, in a box. And here she's doing the same thing at almost exactly the same time on the other side of the Atlantic. And so there's a lot of instances like that. And I even think, Suzanne, I wonder what you think of that. When she was making these, and these are large scale color photographs of close-ups of ears. This is the same time Thomas Ruth was starting to make large scale color pictures of his classmates in Dusseldorf and she was also working in Dusseldorf at the time. So she connects up with all these different right. movements and breakthroughs. And they were all probably in school together. Yeah. In Dusseldorf. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We, we found out later, some, some of the information is still a little bit flaky and hard to find and is still coming out in the research, but af only after we bought this picture did we find out that this is actually Issa's it's ear. It's Issa's ear, yeah. right. That I, yeah, that I did. Yeah. She didn't photograph your ear, did she? No. Yeah. <laughs> you might not have known her quite at this, uh, at this point. No, not so. when she was making these photographs. But yeah. Um, but can you say a little bit about, about this, this kind of... Um, the multiplicity in her work and how she would bounce around. I mean, did, did people think the work lacked cohesion or was not serious or anything like that because of this um, seemingly scattershot sort of yeah. style that she had? We've talked about this a little in the, you know, from my personal interpretation, and I'm very instinctive or whatever when I look at things. The, the issue of balance has been this thread that runs throughout Issa's work. And certainly at that time, again, she'd only been making work for 10 years, barely at the time that I showed her at the Renaissance Society. Um, if you think about um, balance, I mean the inner ear is what really controls one's balance. So we're back to the notion of balance. If you look at those ellipsoids, these 30 foot long wooden pieces, they are balanced in the center 
by section, or it t they touch the ground, about it's the width of a, of a dime, right? It must be half an inch of, of that uh, sculpture that is, sets the balance. Um, when the, the um, she made, we brought her to Chicago um, before the exhibition, and she was just thrilled to be able to visit all the architectural sites, and especially she loved, and I have to say as I do, the John Hancock building. It's such a uh, building of great grace, and, and but of strength in particular, and the, um, the notion of that X and showing you the, 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 the center of how the, the dynamic of that building really works. And of the uh, Dearborn windows, they're done with resin, but if you look inside the resin, there are these wires that are structured, and they're off-center. You know, they're, they're never perfectly straight, but, and yet the, the window is straight, but inside is this thing that's, that's a little off-kilter. The same with the paintings we were talking earlier. Here's, oh, there. here's this one. And you can see that, that, that there is the, it's yeah, the, the see, really not centered. It's not centered. Space. And there were some that where it was just tipping a little, you know, and it's always like struggling, struggling to, to get back to that center part. Um, and at that time, for me, that was the thread that ran through a lot of the different kinds of, of um, pieces. The notion of, you know, when she was doing the concrete pieces, something that I've always been aware of in Europe is counterpoint. If you want to understand one thing, then put something completely dissimilar next to it. Uh, and with those beautiful long ellipsoid pieces, we showed the concrete pieces. And they, this kind of, um, of work, and so it was the more brute uh, surface, brute idea, than the refined um, work of the, of the ellipsoids. I think it's worth um, mentioning that if any of you want to see one of these in person, there is a, a related yeah. piece to this here at the fair at the uh, David Warner booth. At least it was there the last couple days. Right. Um, Gorgeous. Yeah, it's Gorgeous. the same very, as Suzanne was saying, these really rough, crude concrete pieces that are formed with boards and sometimes with styrofoam or the concrete in there. And they look, um, you know, like, I mean, I, I always find when you look inside them, it feels like you're peering into the ruins of a, maybe a medieval church or something. Mm -hmm. There's this amazing kind of verticality. And, and it seems like when she got to Chicago, you know, just a couple years after this, that the ar architecture here really had a lasting effect on her, on her work. Um, she made a film here. She's only made a handful of films in her career, but one of them was called Chicago Drive that she made here in 92 when she was here working on your show. And um, and then as Suzanne mentioned, this is one of these paintings where she's appropriated that, that X bracing from the John Hancock building. This painting was also here at the fair last year, actually, and was bought by a collector in Chicago and is uh, will be promised to the MCA. So there's yeah. stuff happening out here that ends up in the museums and in the history books. So um, um, it's worth mentioning that. And then this is the also um, sculpture that again, you know, 1992, this is right when she was here, uh, that again relates directly to her experience here, the Hancock building. And so this, you see a little bit of what Suzanne was talking about with the metal structure inside this resin formed uh, X raced structure. And I also have one of these, Suzanne. And Suzanne was talking about the, the Dearborn window or the sort of Chicago window that's sort of uh, kind of a bay window. You can see that too. And again, 1982, it's uh, um, made it itself, its way right into her sculptures. This has got concrete on the top and then resin and uh, rebar on the bottom part. Do you recognize this space where this was shown here? Uh, the Europe somewhere. It looks but almost like the Vitit, the Vitit, not the Vitit, the Boyman's Oh, yeah. She had a show around that time know. there. Yeah. That's the Boyman's, I think. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I, I'd love to ask you about your show with Isa was called Every Picture Des a, everyone uh, needs, Everyone Deserves a Window? A window. Yeah. Sometimes deserves a needs a window. Yeah. yeah. Right. 
And I mean, windows uh, appear a lot in her work. Here's another one I think I've got. Oops, no, maybe, maybe I, I didn't put it in there. But can you talk a little bit about where that came from, or, the, or at least in your um, recollection? Well, I think it was based on her investigation into light. Um, I, when I look at even photos take that she took when, at the exhibition at the Renaissance Society, I mean, the, the room would be really quite empty. It'd just be a paint of a, a can of paint, and yet the reflection of light from the window on the floor clearly was what she was after and looking at. Um, and when she came here and she made the film, um, what's the film called? Uh, Chicago Drive. Chicago Drive. Uh, it was in black and white and um, in color as well. It went back and forth from, from the two. But again, in that, clearly she was very interested in uh, light, uh, the, the way that the light fell uh, on surfaces in the city in the city, especially on concrete. Uh, and I was mentioning earlier, working with uh, German artists early on, when they would come to Chicago, the one thing that just bowled them over was the, the light. And it's because it's a city, uh, we have an alley structure. Uh, unlike in Europe, where the buildings are really cheek to jowl, and maybe there's an inner courtyard. But here we have this great alley system, and so the light falls down into these canyons between the, the buildings, and the, especially the German painters, they're just bowled over by that possibility and, and what it does to the architecture. So it taught me to look at, our, at my own city in a very different way. I mean, you find uh, windows appearing in her work a lot too. I mean, in your catalog that you did, even there's images right. of her shooting outside, out through uh, airplane windows, right. or her shooting outside of hospital windows. Um, right. Even here, you see this little window like sculpture on the right hand side too. It's almost, I mean, thinking of your idea of balance, it's sort of like there's a, a structure, but then there's also a void, you know? Right. Um, um, and part of it, I think it was from this, the Richmond Hotel. Because at one point, that's when she first came, now it's coming back. She stayed at the Richmond Hotel, which is now, what is it, Motel 6 or uh, whatever. It's where everybody in the art fair used to stay, all of the Europeans, you know, eons ago. Um, and that's the, the window. She had clearly a, a window looking out. Because when I look down, I think it's where the art fair, the arts club, is now. I think it was empty. Is it? Down. So, anyway, um, I lost my train of thought. Well, maybe this idea of windows and right. things too. Yeah. And even a lot of her architectural photos, I mean, she's very fascinated with window grids and, and, um, and things like that. Right. And even more recently, she's made paintings on, she's bought somehow the panels that uh, form the windows in a, in, on the interior of an airplane. And she's painting on top of those and pulling the shades down and painting. So this oh. idea of windows and planes and flying through the air and being grounded on the well, that the comes land. back to the German pavilion at, um, in, in Venice. The yeah. astronauts, astronauts flying up, flying up and yeah. into the air. This is what my, my essay for the catalog is called heaven and earth. So I'm trying to explore these dualities oh. between things that are really grounded on the, and you know, bound by gravity and then other things that are more ethereal and flying through the sky, sound waves. Uh, even those those ellipses look like missiles maybe that could fly mm -hmm. off and airplanes. And um, There's even a, I came upon in her archives a screenplay that she wrote that is called Sky. And some of it describes yeah. her flying over these neighborhoods, you know, and observing all kinds of crazy, sordid things that were happening in these suburban really? houses and things. Yeah. That's so. Huh. Well, I'd be curious to hear a little bit about the, the work that you're, you're looking at. I mean, again, I was involved in those first 10 years, but there have been many intervening years and much wonderful work since. Yeah, well, I mean, it seems like, you know, up through your show, especially, the work was still very abstract. Um, and not a lot of maybe you know narrative content in particular. Um, things like architecture remained a constant um, source of inspiration for her. Like this is a, a sculpture called Wolfgang that you know looks like a like a skyscraper form. It was from a whole group where she made uh, 
portraits of friends. So this is actually a portrait of Wolfgang Tillmans as a building. She did Dan Graham and uh, her dealer Daniel Buchholz and mm -hmm. other kind of friends and collectors. And, um, and let's see what else I have. And then, and then the, I think right around this period, 2000, she had a show at a little space in New York called AC Project Room, which I think really relaunched her career in a way or made her um, evident to a younger generation of artists and critics, I think, um, including, I think probably that's when I sort of maybe discovered her too, because the show was in a tiny little basement space, but really widely uh, discussed and reviewed, made with scrappy materials. You can see kind of netting that you find on a, on a construction site, tape, uh, images of, um, of plants, you know, a, a pedestal made out of plywood and, and other things. And all of a sudden there was uh, a looseness, I think, to the work, maybe, a, a, a grunginess, and, and also maybe some kind of a narrative content that started to come in that I think was a real turning point. Well, that it was a small space, a lot of space. It probably gave her a freedom that she hadn't had before in working with larger galleries or um, significant high-profile, whatever, museums, and that's wonderful. Um, which makes me think a little bit, too, about bringing her here and, and the fact that we took her out of, around. It's what we do when artists come in. We try to get them familiar with our cities. And then I think that, that um, it's a part of encouraging new work um, at the Society. That was something that we felt very proud of, that we either produced or were instrumental in helping the artists to, to realize, if not financially, then in this other way, new work. Um, so when I look at this, it's, it's like the burdens of it all, thrown to the wind, and she yeah. can do whatever she wants. And yet it's hard to see here, but the, there's still a, a pedestal that puts this out of the eye height, which is just uh -huh. like she was doing with those concrete pieces, you know, so there's a consistency that, that continues. I mean, and then the other thing is that she was actually in New York City um, on September 11, 2001, and because she was very fond of New York, I mean, that was an incredibly traumatic experience for her to be there at that time. And the other body of work that started to emerge out of that experience um, was this uh, group of works called Empire Vampire, um, where again, there's a pedestal, but now she's using little army figures and buying things from the 99 cent store, like cheap cups and, and trinkets and spray painting them. But here you can even see uh, images from the World Trade Center behind there as a backdrop. So it's almost this I mean, literal scene of destruction, whereas maybe in those concrete pieces, um, it was still in the realm of, of the abstract or something suggested. But did, what, well, these, I always found these to be t like really difficult pieces. I mean, they look so junky. They, it really is like, oh my gosh, she's lost it. But, I, but then, but I think that that there's something in that that um, is going to end up making these some of the most important pieces that she's maybe ever made. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And then some of those, the early work at, at David Swarns with the strollers and the umbrellas and the, again, it's all like discarded street material, almost or trash. Yeah, and, that, and I think that's what, again, where I especially think younger artists respect, like how willing, absolutely willing she is to just take gigantic risks, um, and here's what some of what Suzanne's talking about. I mean, nowadays she's buying, you know, kind of fancy Philippe Stark chairs like the ones you're sitting on and puts, spray paints them and tips them upside down and matches them with umbrellas from, you know, probably from a, a German cafe or something like that with this Coca-Cola umbrella, um, and, and really expanding beyond a simple, um, pedestal-based sculpture to something more like a room-scale installation. You can even see, see, I'm about to have an image of this, in that, one of those back panels, you can still see this, this cross-bracing of the Hancock Tower, still here in 2005, um, sticking with her and, and being a, an integral part of the work. I'm so glad that this exhibition is coming to Chicago. Uh, it's really, it's a crime that no, that this hasn't been, this, mature, this work hasn't been looked at in a very serious way um, before. Uh, I mean, I think it's, I think the work frustrates people. It's hard, it's hard to find the center, yeah. and, and I think th this language of heterogeneity, I mean, it's, it's surprising that it's like that because, I mean, it's what makes Gerhard Richter's career so fascinating that he could move between genres or someone like James Welling or 
uh, or other people that have done this in, in other fields, but for some reason, um, for her to make these wild leaps is, is really disturbing to people, I think, and confusing. Um, so what this piece will be in our, in our show, too. And our show will go from the, the 1970s all the way up to now. I mean, I think there's, there's probably some pieces from 2012, and I'm sure she'll make something new for the show, too. We'll, we'll see what happens. But um, So it'll really be um, a long view of the work and um, on our the whole f uh, fourth floor of the museum. Um, you can see that, that Ground Zero and 9-11 uh, is still important to her work even here in 2008. And this is similar to what I was talking about where she's buying high-end Italian designer furniture and turning them into architectural models. So this is a, her version of the Memorial Tower. And then I've got one here, which is a, a car park for Ground Zero. And this, this is made with um, cartel um, coffee tables designed by the Borlach brothers that she's you know, taken her liberties with. Um, but I think, you know, even too, this, this idea of what 9-11 of what was like, I and mean, the fact that there was solidity and stability, and then there was nothing, or there was destruction, there was chaos, that, that balance that you were talking about, Suzanne, um, which she, you know, struggles to find in her, in her own life as well as, as in her work, I think. That might be my, my last slide. Oh, well, here, no, here, I mean, again, um, younger artists, I think, who have been a great source of uh, energy and inspiration for her. She's done a lot of work with Wolfgang Tillmans. He's been a close friend for a long time. Uh, Kai Althoff is also someone that she's had a long time friendship with. And this is a fairly recent um, film that they made together uh, that's called The Little Bus Shelter. And so that's Issa on the right there sipping champagne. And, and this is Kai in drag over here. Um, and so we're, we're getting this translated into English so that <laughs> people will be able to understand the antics in this, in this great film. But um, again, she's just really fearless, I think, which is what makes her, her so fascinating to watch. Um, so I wonder if there's any, any other, I mean, some of the things that were happening in Chicago Drive, I've been trying to kind of piece together as a relative newcomer. There's images there of um, this great house that Max Gordon built for the Manilows right. with a little voiceover by John Vinci at, right. at one section. There's some blues music that she uses during one long pan of the, of the skyline. Uh, right. There's an image, I think, of maybe it's Louis Sullivan's tomb, possibly? It starts, so, yes. Yeah. In the cemetery. <laughs> Death. Right. Um, and then it ends, I can't remember, it even comes to the society and to this one wall where we talk a lot about, a lot, <laughs> we don't talk a lot about anything because there's very little dialogue in the, in the film, but about strength and uh, elegance, just in, the, in a simple wall. Um, I pulled out files, this note from her, and I was also saying to um, Michael, when I went to my files, I realized there was a lot of texting, uh, texting, uh, not texting, uh, faxing, going back and forth. Uh, so it was 19, early 91. Um, and the correspondence is disappearing because it's all on thermal paper. And it was really very hard uh, to read. So this is a big problem in, in the future. I, my files are just filled with thermal paper. Um, but anyway, so she talks about the fact that she'd like to uh, do a, a video film about uh, architecture in Chicago. And she asked if we could find uh, a really professional video camera and somebody to work with her uh, on it. But the idea, she says, is um, basically talking very spontaneously about what I see as an artist working, uh, walking in Chicago, looking at architecture. And in fact, that is not, she deviated from that, in that her voice was practically not there, right? Um, a little, some music, some blues, um, the notion of switching back and forth from black and white. Here we go to counterpoint again, right? If I think about the earlier uh, concrete, and then this later work, 
um, she was switching from the, the color to black and white. I don't know. And she wasn't, she's not very self-conscious about speaking in English either. I mean, she's... No, but she's not a speaker. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why artists make art. <laughs> they were writers, they write make poetry or write books, I guess. Um, one other little little tidbit that I remember hearing about from that time, I mean, one other part of her biography is that she was married to Gerhard Richter around the time that um, your show happened. And I had heard, maybe even you told me, that he pointedly didn't come to the opening right. because he didn't want to, you know, again, overshadow right. her. He wanted this to, to be her moment. Can Which I thought that? was a very tender gesture. Uh, and she spoke of it, and she said that he told her that it wasn't the through lack of support that he was not coming, but he wanted the day to be about her. And I thought that was a very beautiful thing. Is there anything else that you can um, remember about their relationship, or, or not even so much their personal relationship, but even kind of an artistic exchange or dialogue or, or, or influence maybe that was passed between them? Um, hmm. Well, they had studios nearby at the time, and I want to say it was almost on the other side of the of their apartment. Um, she said he was a good clerk. <laughs> so, be kind of surprising, but to know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the one fascinating fact is that he was he started making his squeegee, you know, the scrape paintings at around the exact same time that she was starting to do that technique in her in her basic research paintings. Mm -hmm. And I think that's still something that needs to be kind of untangled a little bit, you know, right. in terms of who, who did right. that first. And right, he was her teacher. Mm -hmm. They were married and they had studios close to each other. Some of that, I guess, maybe you just have to fight not to let it seep in. Uh, although I was looking, there was a picture in uh, one of the catalogs of her studio looking out the window, and um, a, there was a lot of um, stone that reminded me, you know, if she were to take the stone out of the, the uh, courtyard, out of the building in the courtyard, it would be like a piece at, at David's. I mean, there, she was just looking very closely at everything nearby and the light, how the light fell on it. There. If you look at the cracks, um, I'm sure if you look at buildings, you find this kind of um, breakdown of stone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we can open it up to some questions that all might have out there in the audience. Yes. Maybe I can restate the question so people can hear. It. The question was about the well-known links between like New York and Cologne around this time, but how much was Chicago also part of that link and, and dialogue? You mean, mm, I can only speak from my point, and maybe you know if you think more about the history of the MCA. I mean, I was looking very much towards Europe, definitely. Um, and when I talk about Casper and Porticus being a model, I was very aware of, of what was going on there. Um, and I, any opportunity I could have to go to Europe, I would seize it and work with these artists. I mean, with Thomas Struth, I met many of the artists around him or around the, 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 uh, in the art scene at that time. Um, we didn't have money at the Renaissance Society for me to travel, but just you know, any gig from some consulate or whatever, I'd be ready to go. Um, but when you say, how was Chicago? I mean, so we were involved, and I'm just trying to think of the MCA at that time. 
I know that we had done a very early show of Richter, uh, especially abstract paintings, uh -huh. around the time that they were, you know, first made. Um, <coughs> and I know I've heard stories even of someone like like Lou Manilow. Uh, Cologne was sort of his his backyard. I mean, traveling right. there all the time to see work and and bringing it back and collecting it here. And um, I would guess that I mean I think the MCA's program was fairly Eurocentric too mm -hmm. at that at that point also. Um, and the art, you know, what something that was very important, I don't know if this is a point of it at all or not, was the art fair. Um, here, Art Expo, it's called then, at Navy Beer. Um, that was a very exciting time when that fair came to town. And the dealers loved to come here because of the collectors like Manilow and um, Hoffman's, uh, Jerry Elliott. They were great collectors in Chicago. And I made, I, like Albert Erlen, I think I first saw at a Max Hetzler booth here, uh, Günther Ferg, little lead painting stopped me dead on my track going down one of these halls at, at uh, Navy Pier. It was very, very influential, I think, for not only for us who lived here to see work from Europe, but from, for the uh, European dealers to get out and to see what was going on here. Chris Wool. I mean, at one time we did an exhibition of Harold Erlen Wool, and that happened really through Max Hetzler, you know, discussions, just talking, shooting the breeze with him about, gee, yeah, and here's Chris from the United States. How does that fit into the, the European, the, to the work being done? Um, so it was a two-way stream, but boy, Art Expo was, I mean, I'm delighted that they're back. I hope that it will be a great run and that they'll be back again next year because it was so, so important for all of us in this community at that time. Well, we're at, we are at Mount Olive. Well, it was there to be seen. Our, and our uh, biggest audience, I, and first audience, is the artist. <laughs> I mean, the art schools are great art schools in the city, and um, the artists come. It's very, very important. And they should be out looking at all of the, the museums and what's going on. from another place, don't you think? I mean, Doris Salcedo talking about the disappeared. Um, yeah, there's a much more of a political, political message. Yeah, but, but funny enough, Doris Salcedo is having a big retrospective right after Issa's at the museum. So we'll have, we'll have a chance to ask Doris about right. that and we'll see if people like you maybe 
uh, find connections across those, those two artists' work. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Great, well thank you, and hopefully you'll get a chance to uh, see the show at the uh, MCA next spring. Thanks thank for coming out.